ever seen in episode 11 of Shadow Hunters has just premiered. Shadow Hunters! I had high hopes for this episode because ages ago when I first interviewed the cast, the producer McG had mentioned that episode 11 was his favorite episode. I care so much about these characters, about the story, about the way the story is told. Well, I ended up having a lot of issues with this episode. That's not to say that I'm expecting it to be exactly how it goes in the book. I'm just expecting it to be good and I'm just not taken by the plot right now. I'm extremely happy that the show has been picked up for a second season. I'm happy that all these sweet, beautiful actors in the show get to continue on with this job. And number two, that gives the show a chance to get better. The show right now, to me, feels like it was put together in a rush. In a flurry of deadlines, they just needed to get it out there, just like a lot of YA adaptations feel like nowadays. And to me, it always feels condescending, that it doesn't matter how good it is. It only matters that it's out there. There's a million plot holes in it, and apparently the showrunners don't care about those plot holes. And the fact that they expect us to continue and loving every episode, despite the fact that the story doesn't make sense, is condescending. If we as an audience are telling them that we're smarter than this, that we want a more intelligent show, we want a show that follows its own rules, a show that makes legitimate sense week to week, they're gonna try to change to suit that audience. They know that the fandom's obsessed with Mal, that's why they put in so much weird malic tension in this season. If they know that the story is a big thing for us, I'm hoping that the writers will start to pay more attention to how they mold the plot and how they mold the individual characters rather than just looking at it episode to episode and seeing what would be most convenient to happen in this episode right now. What would look cool to happen right now in this episode? That's what I feel like the mindset has been. Maybe these writers rushed. Maybe they were thrown in a room and then you have to create 13 episodes and they have like five weeks to do it. And that is not enough time to write a 13 episode show based on this epic fantasy series that took hundreds and hundreds of pages to build this intricate world. I want to be able to be like, this show is fucking awesome, everyone should watch it. Right now, I would never say that. I would tell them that they should watch it because it's fun and I want them to support it and I want the show to get better. But if we're just complacent with how the show is and we don't talk about our opinions, how is anything supposed to change? Okay, let's get into the episode. My grade for episode 11 would be, I guess a C. I've said this before, it's continuously a positive on my list. The show feels cohesive now. The acting feels cohesive now. My biggest positive in this episode was Alan Van Sprang. I love him. He has this commanding presence. He's so charismatic. And that is a huge part of Valentine Morgenstern. And I love that he so accurately portrays it. Like that's all I could really say about spoiling the episode. So if you haven't watched it, then go ahead and watch it and then come back and you can watch the rest of this review. Bye people who haven't watched it yet, bye non-spoileries. So this episode starts off where last episode ended when we open a locker and we find Michael Whalen. Everyone and their mom last week was like, what if Michael Wayland was just using a glamour and he's actually Valentine and he's been Valentine all these years, but he was disguised as Michael Whalen. But it just felt like such an obvious play to me. The, the fact that they introduced this idea, this plot hole, okay? This giant plot hole that a shadow hunter can cast a glamour to look like another shadow hunter needlessly in the episode where Lydia Branwell is introduced was ridiculous to me. Like you can't use this plot hole that you created to be a giant twist because it's not gonna surprise me. When he changed, I wasn't surprised, I wasn't shocked, I was disappointed because that felt like such a easy play. And on top of the fact that it was an easy play, it didn't make sense. Clary and Jace are in this alternate universe. Valentine doesn't know they're there. Valentine doesn't know when they're gonna come through the portal and find him. How could he know? So how long has he been disguised as Michael Wayland hiding in a locked locker? How long? Because it's an instantaneous thing when Clary and Jace appear through the portal. It's not like he can hear them coming. It's not like he can see them outside. Oh, there they come. I get back. Better get in my locker. No. For this to make sense, Merlin had to actually have been working with Valentine. He had to have told him that his children were going through an interdimensional portal to the other dimension to find a portal that they could go through and find him in. Oh, we find Michael Wayland. He comes back with us. And the next time we see them, they're coming into Luke's and an irate's ruin isn't working, which kind of confuses me because they said that that this was a Ravner demon. And I mean, I don't know if this is the same in the TV show. In the book, when Clary gets attacked in her house, in the very beginning, she's attacked by a Ravner demon and she's saved by Jace using an irates on her. So the irates works 
But the irates are, just aren't working on Jace, which, okay. And then they bring him to Luke's? I just don't get that. I don't understand. We've set up on the show. I understand that this isn't in the books. They don't use silent brothers in the show like they do in the books to heal people. But in the show, we've seen that they take people to Magnus to heal them. Why wouldn't they go to Magnus? Magnus is a person that we've gone to in the past for help healing people. I don't understand the logic to give him a blood transfusion. I just don't get it. There's, there's ruins for blood transfusions in the Shadow Underworld. They're not mundane. They don't actually donate blood so that they could have blood transfusions. They use ruins. They have blood transfusion ruins. I just, it was so weird. They just wanted Simon to be in the episode for a longer time, maybe? So they changed the whole ideology of the world just so that he could go get a bag of blood? I just, honestly, that was just so weird to me. Because I'm such a huge fan of the book, but also because I'm paying such close attention to the show, I'm trying, I'm trying so hard to make the show make sense to me. And it's not making sense. It just constantly is just going wacky. If you're planning these rules, you have to stick with them. Fantasies are so dependent on rules. If you don't have rules, your story is just floating up in the sky. Anything can happen. If anything can happen, what makes the story compelling? <sighs> in episode 10, there was all this wonky ridiculousness and I found it funny. And I was able to kind of ignore the ideology of the show because I was so taken by this ridiculousness that they had put in it. But this week, there was nothing for me to really grasp onto to be like, oh my god, I love this so much, I can ignore the rest of what's going on. Back to the Michael Wayland is Valentine ordeal. When Michael and Clary are helping Jace to get to this portal that Valentine has, he specifically brings up this story from Jace's childhood. Do you remember when we're almost dying and you said I'm ready to die and I said sometimes it's braver to live than to die and Jace's like, yeah. Yeah, I do, it's really you. And they have this moment where they put their heads together. So that was the show trying to set up the fact that Michael Whelan must be Michael Whelan. Let's throw us off track, it's not Valentine. Okay, we keep going. And Michael Whelan says that he's been there for 10 years and he's heard a lot of different stuff. So he knows a lot of different stuff about Valentine. There's this flashback that just absolutely doesn't make sense with the plot twist that they're trying to plant. Cause there's this flashback looking through the locker, looking through the little prison cell, presumably from Michael Whelan's point of view. Cause why else would we be hearing it? And he's telling the story to Jason, Clary and Luke, I think we see him looking through the locker, seeing Valentine talking to one of his minions. It just it absolutely doesn't make any sense. If he is Valentine, then he can't be both here and there. Why would we even see it? Jason Clary can't see this flashback that they're showing us, right? He's just telling them the story. So it could plausibly, if he was just telling them the story, be a lie. But the fact that we're getting to see this weird flashback from the point of view of the locker where we see Valentine outside it, it makes no sense. Why would you even show that? Because you're showing that there's two separate people, but there aren't two separate people. Just, what? I, what? This is not nitpicking. This is just ridiculous writing. Michael Whelan in this episode, when they inquire about his death, he goes, yeah, Valentine tried to kill me, but I survived. And then I was kidnapped for 10 years. If Valentine tried to kill Michael Whelan and Michael Whelan survived the attack, but Valentine kidnapped him. I mean, why wouldn't Valentine just finish the job? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Valentine's a smart guy. He's not gonna come in trying to kill you and then decide halfway through to keep you as an experiment. He's either going in to kidnap you or he's going in to kill you. I just, I'm also just uncomfortable with the amount of blackmail coming from the characters that we know and love. Simon and Clary go to Raphael to get this blood and they blackmail Raphael into giving it to them. I just, I don't know, it's just weird to see Simon doing that. I could see it like maybe further on in the series, but there hasn't been enough character development for me to really accept the fact that Simon would jump to blackmailing Raphael, the only person that he really has helping him with this vampire ordeal right now. The guy really in charge of his life right now. I would think that before doing that, he would talk to Claire and be like, you know, Magnus was able to help Luke when he was sick and in trouble. Maybe we should ask him to help us with Jace. This episode is the first time they start to imply that there will be a 
Simon Clary relationship happening probably in the next season or maybe at the last episode of this season something will start with them. When Clary leaves Simon with Raphael, she kisses him on the cheek. The, this Izzy trial is happening in this episode. We have this shot in the Institute where the Inquisitor comes and it's like the dumb Strang students have arrived at the Institute. They all have these big sticks and the music sounds so much like that scene in Harry Potter where it's like, don't, 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 don't. Don't. When Michael was talking about how Valentine gave him the tools to hear everything that was going on, he injected him with demon blood, I was thinking maybe, maybe Michael Wayland is gonna be like the Sebastian in the TV series. Maybe he's going to be the villain next season, but <laughs> no. We go back to this trial ordeal and Izzy and Alec decide to hire Magnus as their lawyer. The whole trial scene felt like a parody where they were mashing together shadow hunters and like law and order or something. Oh god, I skipped the scene where Alec comes to ask Magnus to be their lawyer. So Alec asks on behalf of Izzy if Magnus will defend her and Magnus says it's gonna cost him. Alec asks what it will cost him and Magnus says you. I will want to do you. I'll do you for free. I just, I don't understand. I don't understand why they're making it like Magnus is blackmailing Alec into being with him. It felt like prostitution. He said, what will it cost? It wasn't like, I just want you to give me a chance to be with you. Like maybe if I do this, we can go on a date. It was like, this is the price for me defending your sister. You. I, I don't, how am I supposed to ship that? You know, how am I supposed to ship that in the next episode? Alec hasn't been pro Malik these last few episodes. He's been pro Lydia only. Magnus insists that he knows that this is going to make him happy. In the show, I feel like they don't know each other well enough to say that. And it just in general, Magnus would never ever do that. And Alec says, do you want anything else? And Magnus says, yeah, your bow and arrow. I, why would Magnus ever want Alex's bow and arrow? Why is that special at all? That's not like a special piece. He could get another bow and arrow. It's not like Katniss's father carved that bow for him and it's never gonna be the same because her father's dead. It's just a bow. It's just a bow that he bought from a weapon shop. We have the trial. I just couldn't really take it seriously. Even like the trial hall that they were in just didn't feel real to me. Like I agreed with Magnus when he was like, this whole trial is irrelevant. That was a nice line. I loved Magnus making fun of the shadow hunters when he was like, I know the law is the law. <laughs> and when Lydia Branwell was put on trial, well, the law is hard, but it's the law. And you get a shot of Magnus rolling his eyes. After Jace has had his blood transfusion and he's feeling better, they have this kiss and I don't know if you were having these same flashbacks, but I was having Twilight flashbacks. It felt like that first kiss in Twilight. It was filmed in a way where it looked like it too. They were slowly coming towards each other and then all of a sudden they were like, <gasps> a sword prop in this trial scene. I don't understand why they must make it weird and have it in a block of glowing ice. In the first episode, or the second episode, when Clary goes to the Silent Brothers, does it not come down from the ceiling and touch her head? I mean, are you telling me that there was a block of ice above her with it in it and they lowered the block of ice to her head? I don't, why is it in a block of ice? Why don't they just put it in their hands so it looks legitimate and not like a cheesy prop? The way the handle glowed, like Rudolph's nose, why? It's a really important, powerful sword, but you made it look like a toy that we bought at Walmart. We have this scene with Michael and Jace and Clary, and they're talking about going to Renwick's to find Valentine. And Clary goes, I have the cup. Demons have to obey me. Michael says, if you use the cup, Valentine's just gonna take it and he's gonna kill all of us. And Clary, she looks straight ahead and she goes, let him try. And there's this quick zoom on her face. This is ridiculous. Level two initiated. Clary versus Valentine. In no world would Clary be able to beat Valentine right now. When we get to this scene in Renwick's with Clary and Valentine, the second half of this scene was like my favorite part of the episode, but the first half of it just didn't really sit well with me. Like I was completely disappointed when Michael Whalen turned into Valentine. But of course, Alan Van Sprang was in the scene now, so everything shot up a little bit. Right before that, Clary had been like, demons, I could Command you to listen to me. That felt ridiculous. The line is just not working in this context. She's holding a cup out in front of her and you don't even see the demons. You just see 
shadows. It looks like a show. It's like a shadow puppet show along the wall. Valentine gets the cup. He holds it. He commands the demons to listen to him. And I'm like, okay, I believe you. Because you're a little scary. But then Clary tells the demons to knock it off like they're friends now. Now that I have the cup, me and the demons were like on the same page. We were going to humor you for a moment when you were saying I command you to go after my enemies. But this whole time, they were just listening to me. And then she pulls out her real cup. <laughs> Lol, you're stupid. And Valentine's cup turns into a world's best dad mug, which I appreciated that. That was funny. For half a second, I was like, lol. How did Clary create this replica of the mortal cup? We've never seen her do arts and crafts and create a fake cup. We've never seen her cast a replicating spell like Hermione does with the Slytherin locket in Deathly Hallows. And I understand that this wasn't a replica. It was a glamour on the cup. But I'm just, this was just the things that were popping into my head at this moment. But we've also never seen Clary cast a glamour on something that wasn't herself. How do you cast a glamour on an object. Do you have to draw ruin on them? We've never seen her do it. Correct me if I'm wrong. Have we seen her cast a glamour on something and make it look like something else? Have we even seen her cast a glamour on herself other than to make herself invisible? I mean, just seeing her cast a glamour on anything ever would have made this believable, but there's no pretense for it at all. She's an untrained shadow hunter. Why would she know how to do this? And Jace didn't know she was doing this, so Jace couldn't tell her how to do it. I don't understand! So Lydia's put on trial by Magnus. She realizes that this whole trial is irrelevant. She withdraws the charges, and there's this uplifting family music. I love how Magnus makes the papers swirl up in the air, and all of a sudden there's confetti in them. Like he had some confetti planted in there for when they won, so that he could spurt it up in the air with the papers. So back to the scene with the Morgan Stearns and Renwick. Then we have the second half of the scene, where Valentine takes back complete control of the room by dropping the fact that he is both Jace and Clary's father. And I really liked this little bit of the show. It gave me the chills. All I wanted was this scene in Renwick's to happen like it happened in the book. And it was really close. I mean, Alan Van Sprang was fantastic. He's so good. And Jace just looks like he's gonna cry for the rest of the episode. It's okay to feel that way since, you know, you've been dating your supposed sister. And he kind of drops all pretense of fighting Valentine once he finds this out. And Clary thinks she can still take on Valentine. I could kill you. Clary... Please. And I just hate when she says things like that. You can go fight him, but don't say that I can kill you, because you can't. See, you're not trained at all in killing. Valentine is a killing machine. You sound ridiculous. Alec and Jace have a confrontation. I liked what Jace said, but Alec didn't accept it and they didn't make up. Magnus has another talk with Alec. I like what he says about liking Lydia. He understands Lydia. She's a good person, but you don't have to marry her and she doesn't have to marry you. And it's not gonna be a happy marriage for either of you. You're both gonna be lonely for the rest of your lives. Neither of you deserve that. And I'm like, okay, good, that's nice. But then he says, I don't deserve that. And I'm just like, no. Magnus would never say that. It's not about him. He's like a bajillion years old. He understands the world. He would never say something petty like, I don't deserve that, when they're not even going out. The script is so weird. It's so weird. It doesn't make sense. It's like every episode, they're just like, we're gonna do whatever we want in this episode. It doesn't matter what happened in the last episode or what's gonna happen in the next one. This makes sense to me right in this moment, so I'm gonna do it. So we'll see what happens next week. I hope I like it better than this week. Those are my thoughts. I want to love the show. I want to so bad. I love to hear your thoughts and feelings. Thank you for watching. I'm Christine. I'm at Xtine May on Twitter. I'll see you next time.